بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ما بعد. In our last week we had done the incidents of Maruna and Al Raji. And the next uh, major incident that uh, occurred, we're actually going to postpone it till next week. And we need to catch up with other incidents that are not directly related to the Ghazawat. But there are things that are happening that are in the personal life of the Prophet ﷺ. So we need to get up to date with that. And in particular, the marriages of the Prophet ﷺ that took place around this time and before this time, which we have been obviously sidelining because of the major political events. Now. With regards to the marriages of the Prophet ﷺ, inshallah, uh, maybe inshallah when we finish we'll try to have more light on each of the Ummahat al Mu'mineen. But we need to understand what's going on at this particular time uh, in the personal life of the Prophet ﷺ. After the death of Khadija, uh, we talked about Khadija by the way, an entire lecture, it's online, uh, an hour and a half lecture about all of the details of Khadija. And uh, obviously the status of Khadija and the love that the Prophet ﷺ had for her. Uh, it is said that after Khadija died, uh, for many months the Prophet was not seen smiling. He was so devastated by her death. Eventually, uh, Khawala binti Hakim uh, suggested to him, Why don't you marry someone, Ya Rasulullah? So uh, he said, Who do you suggest? Who do you have in mind? So she said, If you want an elderly lady, then Sauda. And if you want a young lady, then Aisha. And so the Prophet married the both of them within a month of each other. Uh, but Aisha, he did not consummate the marriage for another three and a half years. Okay, so he just got the nikah done. And Aisha deserves multiple lectures. Insha'Allah, she will have a long series. Insha'Allah, maybe when we finish, we'll look at Aisha. Uh, and as for Sauda, so the next wife of the Prophet after Aisha was therefore Sauda. And Sauda, her name is Sauda binti Zam'a uh, ibn Qais ibn Abd al-Shams. And her previous husband was a Sukran ibn Amr, who is the brother of Suhail ibn Amr. And a Sukran had migrated to Abyssinia. And he either died in Abyssinia or right after his return. He died a very early death. He's one of the few Sahaba whose name we know who died in the Meccan era. And her family, when she had converted to Islam, her family had disowned her. Her family had cut her off. And she really had nobody else in Mecca to take care of her. And so uh, the Prophet ﷺ felt compassion for her and married her probably in Shawwal of the 10th year of the Da'wah. Probably in Shawwal of the 10th year of the Da'wah. And she was also the oldest or the eldest of all of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. We do not have any dates of her age, but we know that she was the eldest and we also know that she was a rather large lady and she would walk very slowly. And we know this because she herself tells us this and because she says that in Hajjatul Wada, in the farewell Hajj, I asked permission uh, from the Prophet to leave Muzdalifa early because she was a lady that walked very slowly and she was of a large build and she wanted permission to avoid the crowds. She wanted permission to avoid the crowds to get to Mecca before the rest of the crowd. And so Ibn Abbas was sent with her to uh, basically take her in a small entourage or a small group. In the Medinan era, probably around the 6th or 7th year, we don't know exactly when, she began to feel that uh, perhaps the Prophet might divorce her. And so she negotiated of her own will. She negotiated of her own will with the Prophet wasallam, And she said, O Messenger of Allah, I have no jealousy of your other wives, meaning my age is not like this. I have no jealousy of your other wives. So, uh, and I want to be with you so that I can be resurrected amongst your wives in Yawm Al-Qiyamah. In Akhir, I want to be with you. So, take my night and give it to Hafs, uh, give it to Aisha. Take my night and give it to Aisha. And so, she gave up her night, that was her obviously uh, portion, and she voluntarily d donated it to Aisha, knowing that the Prophet ﷺ obviously would welcome this. And it is said that when she did this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in Surah An Nisa, verse 128. And Surah An Nisa is around this time, fourth, fifth, sixth year Hijrah, Surah An Nisa, so it fits in perfectly. In Surah An Nisa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, verse 128, Surah An Nisa, When imra'atun khafat min if a woman fears 
that her husband will uh, abandon her or leave her or uh, not treat her in a good manner. Now obviously the, uh, the ayah is not just for them, it's for the, all of the wives. So if a woman feels that her husband will leave her or, or not uh, treat her the way that she wants, then she can negotiate something with him. And the two of them can agree to any type of conditions between them. And these conditions are good. وَالصُّلْحُ خَيْرُ and these conditions are good. And of course, this too is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no doubt about that. That Aisha was, as we know, the Prophet's uh, favorite wife after Khadija. And he did want to spend more time with her, but he could not do so because he was being fair to all of his wives. So it is as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically willed for him that he has a lady that has no need uh, for his night and for her night with him, and she will just gift him of her own free will. So it is as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gifted uh, the Prophet to have a double share with Aisha. And this clearly uh, shows us the permissibility of uh, negotiating even amongst spouses of that which is their right. And she died relatively early in the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab. Uh, she died in the time of Umar al-Khattab and she is buried in Baqi' al-Gharqad. This is the second wife and we're just discussing her now because we need to catch up. We haven't discussed this tangent uh, even though the marriage took place obviously in Mecca. And uh, she was the first wife after Khadija. So right after Khadija, by probably six months or so, uh, he married uh, Sauda. As for Aisha, as we said, she deserves multiple lectures. You cannot talk about Aisha in a few minutes. Uh, she has so much to mention. Uh, and she was the one, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu said that in a dream he saw basically an angel carrying uh, a lady that was covered up to him. And uh, the angel said, this shall be your wife. And he uncovered the, the hijab or the veil and it was Aisha. And so, and this is in Sahih Bukhari. And so he said, if this dream is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it will come to pass. And it did come to pass that Aisha became his uh, wife. And the nikah was done, as we said, in Mecca. But the marriage was consummated later in Medina in the second year of the Hijrah. In the second year of the Hijrah, uh, the marriage was consummated. And Aisha, as we said, deserves an entire separate lecture. The third uh, lady, or actually it's the fourth now because Khadija is the first. So we're not even going to consider that. So uh, let's start memorizing the names because wallahi... Hardly any of us has memorized these names, right? So number one, Khadija. Number two, Sauda. Number three, Aisha. Number four, Hafsa. Hafsa binti Umar. Hafsa, the daughter of Umar ibn al-Khattab. And Hafsa was married right at this time. So now that's why we're talking about the other marriages. That they basically, Hafsa is now marriage taking place at this stage. So chronologically, this is the marriage that we need to speak about. Now, Hafsa, most likely she was born five years before the da'wah began. Most likely around five, maybe six, seven years, but around a few years before the Prophet began preaching, before the wahi began. And she was married at a very young age, very young age, probably 12 or 11 of this, uh, uh, to one of the early converts, his name was Khunais ibn Hudhafa. Khunais ibn Hudhafa. And she migrated to Abyssinia with her husband Khunais. And we hardly know anything about Khunais because obviously he died an early death because that is how she became a widow. All that we know is that Khunais participated in both Badr and Uhud. So no doubt this was a very blessed and fortunate Sahabi to be participating in both Badr and Uhud. And there were only a handful of the Muhajirun uh, at Badr and at Uhud, as you know, around uh, 70 uh, 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 or so. And this is obviously one of the elite then of the Sahaba. In Uhud, he was severely wounded. And he was carried back to Medina and he passes away right after Uhud. So basically he dies at Uhud. A shaheed, but because of the wounds, not on the battlefield. But it is still a shaheed because he died because of the wounds. And Hafsa was extremely traumatized. She's just lost her husband. She's very young. She's probably 19, 20 years old at this time. And uh, she is very pained and lonely that she has just lost her husband. And she did not have any children. She's at the prime of her youth. And Umar uh, feels for her and Umar wants to help her out. And after her idda is over, so Umar goes to Uthman ibn Affan. And he speaks to Uthman ibn Affan and he says that, Uthman, what do you think of Hafsa? Now obviously when the father is asking about his daughter, it's understood that there is a 
uh, a marriage proposal, right? And this was how they would do marriage proposals, that the wali would go find somebody suitable, and then basically uh, uh, offer, if you like. This was typically the way that it was done, that the wali would typically offer the one uh, that uh, he is in charge of, and the other way is also permitted, and that is that the man comes to the wali and says, I'm interested in your uh, your girl or the girl that you're the wali of. But generally speaking, it was the, the person who has uh, the, 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 the daughter or the sister, he would go looking for somebody. So he goes to Uthman ibn Affan. And Uthman, what had happened with Uthman's personal life? His first wife was? His first wife was? The daughter of the Prophet who had passed away? Ad Badr. Ad Badr, right? And Uthman, being the shy person that he was, is still single. Uthman is still single. So he goes to Uthman and he offers Hafsa to Uthman. And Uthman remained quiet, said, let me think about this. And then after a few days, he came back and he said, I think that I don't want to get married right now. Umar felt very much grief at this because this is like a rejection for him and his daughter. And this is Uthman who is a nobleman, he's a Qurashi, he's wealthy, he's every, all the good characteristics you want. From Umar's time, he wants somebody like Uthman, and Uthman, and he's single as well, right? And the fact that he's saying he doesn't want to get married really means, from Umar's perspective, I don't like your daughter, right? So it really hurt Umar. So he took his pride, swallowed it, went to Abu Bakr now. Now Abu Bakr is married, but he wants a noble son-in-law, even if it means his wife's going to be his husband, uh, his daughter is going to be uh, a second wife, right? So he goes to Abu Bakr, and he says the same thing, what do you think of Hafsa? And Abu Bakr was completely silent as well. What can he say? Something is going on, he cannot tell Umar. So he says, let me think about it. And he doesn't return at all for days. He doesn't even know what to tell Umar, right? So Abu Bakr doesn't even give him a jawab. And Umar says, this was much more painful to me than Uthman's. That what's wrong now? What is going on? He doesn't see anything problem with his daughter. What is going on? And according to some books of, uh, uh, of, of uh, Rijal, I didn't find this in Ibn Ishaq and others, but some books of, uh, of uh, you know, narrators of the Sahaba, the biographies of the Sahaba, one of them, uh, it mentions that Umar even went to complain to the Prophet about Abu Bakr and Umar, uh, Uthman. The Prophet said, Hafsa will marry someone better than Uthman. And Uthman will marry someone better than Hafsa. He has a plan. Umar still didn't get it. Umar still didn't get it until finally the khitbah or the proposal came directly from the Prophet ﷺ that he wants to marry Hafsa. And of course, as for Uthman, she married the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ. And afterwards, Abu Bakr came and excused himself and said, perhaps you felt something about against me when I didn't come back to you. So he said, yes, I did. So he said, the Prophet ﷺ had mentioned Hafsa to us. And I could not inform you of his secret. And I didn't know what to tell you. So that's why that uh, is exactly what happened. And uh, this shows us that the Prophet ﷺ, despite being who he was, he's getting mashwara, he's getting istishara, he's getting advice from the other people. What do you think of Hafsa as a wife for me? SubhanAllah, he's asking. And he's asked Abu Bakr, and he's asked Uthman, and so the both of them, they don't know what to tell Umar, right? So they're feeling very awkward now. And then Abu Bakr said to him, and had the Prophet not proposed for her, then I would have accepted. This is the status of Hafsa, that calm down Umar, that had the Prophet not proposed for her, then I would have accepted if you had come, when you had come to me. Hafsa, she was one of the very few ladies who learned how to read and write. One of the very few ladies who learned how to read and write in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab died, remember he was stabbed and he commissioned the six people to be the next Khalifa. So when he died, there is no Khalifa. So the Mus'haf that was written in the time of Uthman, sorry, in the time of Abu Bakr, the grand Mus'haf, the first Mus'haf, Hafsa took this Mus'haf and she kept it with her until she died. And when Uthman wanted to... Uh, copy the Mus'haf, he had to get it from Hafsa. So Hafsa sent the Mus'haf to Uthman, and then it was recopied and then sent all over the, uh, the Buldan, all over the, uh, the, the cities of Islam, and she kept it until she died. She died either 41 or 45 uh, Hijrah, and uh, 
if she died 45, then it is said Marwan ibn al-Hakam, who was the uh, governor at that time, he prayed over uh, her and she was buried in Baqir al-Gharqad. Uh, so this is Hafsa. The next wife that is also uh, married around this time is Zainab binti Khuzayma al-Hilaliya. Now, she is one that we have very, very, very few details about. Why? Because she is the only wife who died in Medina. She died. So the only two wives that died in the life of the Prophet are Khadija and Zainab. And a lot of people get confused between, there was two wives of the Prophet called Zainab. Zainab bin Tijash, that was his cousin. And that's a whole long story we'll talk about whenever we get there. And this is Zainab binti Khuzayma. Zainab binti Jahsh is his cousin. Zainab binti Jahsh is from the Quraysh. Zainab binti Khuzayma is not from the Quraysh. She's from the Banu Hilal. And the Banu Hilal are a tribe in Najd. The Banu Hilal are not Quraysh. They're a tribe in Najd. And because she died so early, and she was married to the Prophet for less than a year. Some say three months, some say five months, some say eight months. Very short period of time. So how, how are we going to know anything, right? She's not from Quraysh. She doesn't have ancestors basically in Mecca. So we have hardly any details about her. All that we know, and even the reports that we know are kind of even conflicted. So uh, whatever we do know, we find conflicting reports. One report says that how did she end up in Mecca? She was married to uh, Tufail ibn al-Hadith ibn Abdul Muttalib. And that is the cousin of the Prophet So So in the days of Jahiliyyah. That she is married to Tufail uh, ibn al-Hadith. And then he divorced her. And so Ubaidah ibn al-Harith married her. So she's now in Mecca, Ubaidah ibn al-Harith. Ubaidah ibn al-Harith, he is one of the three who fought at the Battle of Badr, the Mubarazah. Along with Hamza and Ali. Along with Hamza and Ali and Ubaidah ibn al-Harith, these are the, and Ubaidah was the one who was the oldest and he was the one who was killed. This is Ubaidah. Okay, so he was the oldest of the three, meaning Hamza and Ali. And he was the one who was killed. If you remember the story that he fell down wounded and then Ali came to his defense, Hamza came to his defense. And then on the way back, he basically passed away because his leg was completely uh, uh, cut off and he had another wound in his... We talked about this in the battle, but this is that Ubaidah, right? So Ubaidah married uh, this Zainab binti Khuzayma and she had no family whatsoever in Mecca or Medina because she's from the Banu Hilal. She has no family whatsoever and she was known as... Umm al-Masakin. This is Umm al-Masakin. She was known as Umm al-Masakin. Because she used to take care of the orphans and the poor, she had a, a heart of gold. She would be very generous. She'd, uh, she was known even in the days of Jahiliyyah as Umm al-Masakin. Even before converting to Islam, that was her kunya, Umm al-Masakin. And that shows uh, her pure heart that even before the coming of Islam, she was known for uh, taking care of orphans and, and feeding the poor. That was her laqab or kunya umm al-masakin. And so uh, when her husband uh, uh, died, the process of married her, we don't have an exact date, but probably around the third year of the hijrah as well, because this took place after Hafsa. So um, again, we don't have any details, but we know she didn't have any immediate family. So. Clearly one of the main reasons then is that she does not have anyone to take care of her. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam marries her and she lives only for a few months. Uh, and she passes away in Rabi' al-Awwal of the fourth year of the Hijrah. And she was the only wife to die in Medina. And she was the second wife to die of the Prophet after Khadija. So the only two wives, Khadija and Zainab binti Khuzayma. And she was also the first to be buried in Baqi' al-Gharqad. If you go to Baqi' now, you have all nine graves of the Prophet's wives, one after the other. And Zainab was the first one to be buried over there, because obviously she was the first one to die. And as for Khadija, where is she buried? <laughs> Mecca in Hujun. And so the graveyard of Hujun is called in Mecca. She is buried over there. By the way, Zainab has a really interesting, fascinating tidbit or story that we know not of her, of her mother. Um, uh, it is said in some books of history that Zainab's mother is the most noble mother-in-law in the history of mankind. How so? So let's begin. She has five daughters. Five daughters. And, and she, did, she was not a Muslim. Uh, and all five of them marry luminaries, marry uh, people of import. 
two of them become Ummahat al Mu'mineen. This is another trivia. That Zainab had a half sister, not a full sister. Zainab had a half sister who also later on, not right now, marries the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and that is Maymuna bint al Hadith. Maymuna and Zainab, they had different fathers but the same mother. So Maymuna and Zainab are sisters to each other. Zainab is much older uh, and Maymuna. So the both of them married the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The third daughter, so these are two daughters of this lady. The third daughter was Umm Al Fadl bint Al Harith. Ring a bell? Abbas's wife. Abbas's wife. And Umm Al Fadl gave birth to Al Fadl, obviously, and Abdullah ibn Abbas. Right? So look at how, who this lady is that her grandsons now become. Abdullah ibn Abbas and also Al-Fadl ibn Abbas, two very famous of the uh, Sahaba. And so, the aunt of the Prophet this is Abbas's wife, Umm Al-Fadl, the aunt of the Prophet Now, uh, she had a younger sister. Some say that she was called Lubaba al sughra Umm Al-Fadl's name was Lubaba. Umm Al-Fadl is a kunya. Umm Al-Fadl's name was Lubaba. And she had a younger sister that was also called Lubaba al sughra And Lubaba al sughra she married uh, Al-Walid ibn Al-Mughira. And Al-Walid ibn Al-Mughira is the chieftain of the Banu Makhzum. He is the leader of the Banu Makhzum. And his son is Khalid ibn Al-Walid. Right? So she now has a grandson of Khalid ibn Al-Walid. So by the way, Khalid and uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas are cousins. And Maymuna is their aunt. And we, talk, and we there are many ahadith that they're visiting Maymuna. Ibn Abbas says Khala is Maymuna. And Khalid's Khala is Maymuna. Because Khalid's mother... And Ibn Abbas's mother are sisters of Maymuna. Is that clear? Very? We'll have a quiz next week. Huh? Yes. We'll have a quiz next week. <laughs> so this is Lubaba al Sughra, and we said that she was married to Al Walid ibn al Mughira. Uh, the other daughter that she had is another very famous Sahabiyya. Asma binti Umais. Another very famous name in the books of the seerah. Asma binti Umais. And Asma binti Umais, uh, she was married to Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. And she became a widow at the death of Ja'far. And she was the one whom the Prophet visited and consoled her and took care of his ch her children and Ja'far's children, the, the Yatim of, of Ja'far, the, the orphans of Ja'far. She, was, was, she was the wife that the Prophet consoled directly and said, do not cry over my brother. He called Ja'far my brother. And he said, I will take care of these children and all my children. I will take care of them. Right. So this is Asma binti Umais. She has many ahadith in the seerah. And... Uh, she remained uh, single in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. And then after uh, in the Khilafah of Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr proposed to her and married her a few months before he passed away. And after Abu Bakr's death, Asma married Ali ibn Abi Talib, Ja'far's younger brother. And she gave sons to Ali ibn Abi Talib as well. She's one of those ladies, subhanAllah, she has so many noble husbands. Ja'far, Abu Bakr, Ali, she's been married to all of them and she gave all of them sons. All of them she had children with. This is Asma binti Umais. And the final one, mashallah, you thought that was enough, she has another sister now, right? So the final of these daughters, so they're all sisters, her younger sister, Salma binti Umais. And Salma binti Umais, I made a mistake two weeks ago, which something was ringing in my head when I said it, so I went back and looked up, and that's why I went into all of this tangent uh, today. I told you that Hamza uh, did not have children and was not married. This is wrong. I was wrong. Scrap that. Hamza did have children, and it was something was going in my head. He had a daughter, and in the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah, that daughter is then argued over among some of the Sahaba, who's going to take care of her? The orphan of Hamza. Right? And that's why I was wondering something is not right when I said that to you. So I went back and looked up and this is why the whole tangent led me to all of this research. So Hamza was married to Salma binti Umais. And the two of them, they had Umara binti Hamza. And Umara was a little girl when the Prophet went to 
uh, do the Umrah after Hudaybiyah. He did one Umrah. So uh, Umara, as a young girl, ran back with the Muslims wanting to be with them. And Ali and Ja'far and Zayd, all of them began arguing who would take care of her. I'm going to take care of her. I'm going to take her. I'm going to take care of her. And then they had to go to the Prophet to negotiate who's going to take care of Umara because she's the daughter of Hamza. And every one of them felt the sympathy where they wanted to, to be their, the, 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 the guardian. And so the Prophet gave, it, uh, to gave her to Ja'far because, to confuse you, why? Well, obvious now. It's obvious. His wife, his, wife, his, wife, his, wife. his wife is the Khala. Now you understand why. Right? So actually this makes sense now. <laughs> Except for you, you're not taking notes, so you're completely lost. <laughs> you need to take notes. Draw a chart for us next week, okay? Come and draw your chart next week, then we can take it. So uh, Salma bint Umais, her older sister is Asma bint Umais, right? Asma bint Umais is married to Ja'far. So when Umara is taken, uh, is basically, uh, and she's a young girl, she's not Baligh yet, and she comes crying to the army that she wants, to, to the not, uh, army with the Muslims, that she wants to go away, she doesn't want to stay with the, the people of Mecca. So uh, that's when the Prophet ﷺ had to intervene and say, and he consoled all of them, Zayd and, and, and uh, Ali and whatnot, but then he said, uh, I will give her to you, O Ja'far, because Al Khala to be Manzilatil Um. The Khala is like the mother. And you're married to her khala, and so you will have the most right for, to take care of uh, Umar. In any case, uh, that is uh, Zainab, uh, Zainab binti Khuzayma. And as we said, she passed away in the lifetime of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we'll mention one more whose marriage took place a few months later, but we're not going to pause there, so we might as well just mention right now. And that is Umm Salamata Hind binti Abi Umayyah. Al Makhzumiya. Umm Salam is her kunya, Hind is her name, the daughter of Abu Umayya Al Makhzumiya, so she's also Qurashiya. She is also Qurashiya. So, Umm Salama, Umm Salama, we have heard her name so many times. Umm Salama is one of the uh, well known of the wives of the Prophet. We've just mentioned her in Uhud. That she was of those who had put water on her head and is running around the battlefield. This is Umm Salama. That's the Umm Salama. When Uhud takes place, she's married uh, to her husband, Abu Salama. So obviously, the marriage is going to take place after Uhud. So Umm Salama, her husband was obviously Abu Salama. Abdullah ibn Abdul Asad. And Abdullah, who is Abu Salama, was a cousin of the Prophet from the mother's side. Not from the, the, uh, from, not from the Banu Hashim side. He was a cousin from the mother's side, and she had also emigrated both of the emigrations. And if you notice, by the way, all of the wives of the Prophet, their, their iman and their efforts for Islam, it's like a record, obviously, that the Prophet, whoever he has chosen to be his wife, her contribution to Islam. Emigrating the two hijras is very rare for women. Emigrating the two hijras is very rare for women. And yet, we see so many of them in the uh, list of the names of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ because again, Allah Azza wa Jal will choose those who are worthy to be chosen. So, she had emigrated both of the emigrations and she was the first lady to migrate to Medina as well. The very first lady to give up everything and to go to Medina was Umm Salama. And Abu Salama, her husband, was known for his gentle manners and his akhlaq and they had a very very strong and good relationship and in the battle of Uhud Abu Salama was wounded very severely he also was carried back he recovered from Uhud but never fully and he passed away from his wounds not immediately after Uhud but a few months after Uhud so the wounds kind of healed but not fully and he managed to live a few more months after Uhud, but then eventually he passed away. And on his deathbed, so he's sick on his deathbed, and on his deathbed she comes to him, and this shows you the love that the two of them had, that she says that, I have heard that if a man of Jannah dies, and his wife never remarries, that she will automatically go to Jannah with him. Clear? That if I don't marry after you, then I will enter Jannah with you. And then just to console him, she said the opposite as well. That if a woman of Jannah dies, and her husband doesn't marry, they will be reunited in Jannah. But that's not that he's the one dying, not her. And so she said, so let's make a promise to each other, that we're not going to marry if the one of us dies. SubhanAllah, look even at her manners. 
that her husband's the one dying, but she's the one like, let's both make a promise to each other. In fact, this is a promise she's going to have to keep, not him, because he's dying. Right? So she's trying to inform him that, look, don't, she's putting very nicely to him, right? That don't worry, I'm not going to marry after you. This is like her way of consoling him, that I'm not going to marry after you. So Abu Salama says, will you obey me? So she's happy that he's going to say, he goes, yes, of course, I have never disobeyed you. I've always been obedient to you. So he tells her, then after I die, marry someone. I don't want you to remain single. After I die, marry someone. Then he made a dua on his deathbed. And he said, Oh Allah, Oh Allah, bless her with a husband better than me. Who will take care of her and never harm or irritate her. Subhanallah. On his deathbed he makes this dua. What a husband, wallahi, what a husband. And who amongst us can even... But this is, wallahi, it's a type of love that is... He doesn't want his wife to be alone for the rest of her life. She has a long life ahead. Why should she be alone? So he tells her, when I die, marry somebody. Don't be alone. And then he makes a dua, oh Allah, bless her with someone better than me. And Umm Salama is the famous story, we all know the story of Umm Salama, that she was the one who said, one day my husband came home very happy, and he said, I heard a beautiful hadith from the Prophet She said, what? So he said, the Prophet said, never does anybody afflicted with a musibah, with any calamity, and this is a hadith of Bukhari Muslim, we should all memorize it. It's a well-known hadith. And it's amazing how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically taught it to her, even through her husband. Wallahi, it's amazing. If Allah had wanted, she could have heard it directly. If Allah had wanted, she could have heard it from another sahabiyya. But it is her husband telling her this, right? And all of this, fiqadarillah, that her husband tells her, the Prophet said, never does any musibah, calamity strike anyone. And he is patient at that. And he says, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Allahumma ajuni fi musibati wa khlufni khayran min. And this is, we should memorize it. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Allahumma ajuni fi musibati wa khlufni khayran min. This is something we should all memorize. If you haven't memorized it, go to any book of dua and memorize it. Any time a calamity befalls you, any time somebody dies, any time you lose money, any time you hear you lost your job, any musibah, first thing you do, say this, and everything will be perfect. First thing, but that's the point. Make sure the first thing you say is Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Allahumma ajuni fi musibati wa khlufni khayram min. So she is saying, as soon as Abu Salama died, I remembered this hadith. Well, look at the. We can't call it irony, but the the profundity. Allah's qadr. Everything is so perfect. As soon as Abu Salama died, I remembered this hadith. So I said Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Allahumma ajuni fi musibati fi musibati wa khlufni khayram min. But I said to myself, who can possibly be better than Abu Salama? And she's saying it, but deep down inside she's thinking there's nobody. Who can possibly be better than him? And to show you how great Abu Salama was, the first person who proposed for her was none other than Abu Bakr. After the idda is over, everything says she's now she's open to take proposal, Abu Bakr proposes. And by the way, the Sahaba were not single, by and large. It's not conceivable for them that a man or a woman is just there without a husband or wife. It doesn't make sense for them. And that's why we have all of these proposals. And I have said this many times before that subhanAllah, we have a stigma in our society and time in this regard. Divorcee, widowee, this and that. In those times there is no such thing. The concept of the, she's a woman, she needs a husband, right? This is a, a man without, so it's going to be something that is well known for them. And there was no stigma of a divorcee, there was no stigma of a widow, she has children, she has children. Doesn't matter, somebody has to be their father, somebody has to take care of them. So Abu Bakr proposed. Can you believe turning down Abu Bakr? What does that show you? Right? Abu Bakr she's not satisfied with. SubhanAllah. So she has a high standard. Because Abu Salama now has her heart like nobody can be better than Abu Salama. So after a while, the Prophet ﷺ proposes. And he comes to her directly to propose to her. He comes to the house and he proposes directly to her. Umm Salama was known for her wisdom. She's one of the wisest of the Prophet's wives. She was known for her high lineage as well. She's the Maghzumiyya. She is the, the daughter of the, one of the elders of the Quraysh. And as you know, the Arabs at that time, they did value uh, lineage. And Islamically, there's nothing wrong with taking lineage as one of the factors. Obviously, this is people go to extremes here, uh, that you know, lineage means nothing. No, people like their ethnicity, people like their culture. If your father or your family is a prestigious family, it's something to add 
to the overall Iman and Taqwa, right? And that's not a problem with that. So uh, her father is a high lineage. She herself is known for her wisdom. She's known for as well for her beauty. She was known for her beauty, uh, and we'll come to this as well in a while. And so the Prophet ﷺ proposed, can you imagine even the Prophet ﷺ, she doesn't say yes immediately to. And she says, Ya Rasulullah, the Arabic is eloquent, but it basically translates, how can I not be pleased that you are interested in me? I'm very honored that you're interested in me, but there are three things you should know. Look at her intelligence, like, let me put the cards on the table for you, right? Rather than, oh, let's just go do this, and then, no, think about these three things. Number one, I am a woman that has ghiyara, jealousy, and especially with the relationship she had with Abu Salama, so she has this ghiyara. And you are a man that has already wives. And notice her iman now. I am worried that that jealousy will act up and will displease you, which will then displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah. Like I'm worried that I might end up displeasing Allah by showing jealousy in this situation. So the Prophet said, that's one, what's the second? So he said, the sec she said, the second, I am a woman that is coming on in age. And I'm not young anymore. So she, he had Aisha, he had Hafsa, these are the prime. She is probably in her mid-30s, if not more than that. She is not, uh, you know, 19 or 20 anymore. So she's saying, I'm a woman who's coming on in age. She said, this is the second, what's the third? She said, I'm a woman that has family. I have children. She had four children, by the way. She had four children from Abu Salama. So the Prophet ﷺ said, As for your ghira, I will make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it will be removed from your heart. Don't worry about the ghira. And then, and notice this joke of the Prophet ﷺ, As for your age, I am afflicted with the same calamity as you. <laughs> this is of his humor, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? I am afflicted with the same calamity. I have the same disease, don't worry. Right? Meaning I'm also not 20 years old. And notice his adab and his mulatafa and his uh, yani joking, you know, that I also have the same calamity. And as for your family, they are my family. Subhanallah, what a beautiful proposal, right? What a beautiful proposal. And so once all of this has been clarified and done, obviously, uh, Umm Salama then marries the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam probably sometime around the fourth year of the Hijrah, maybe Shawwal, maybe Ramadan of the fourth year of the uh, Hijrah. And Umm Salama, a lot can be said about her, but the most important, if you like, uh, story that we, we hear is the story of Hudaybiyah. The story of Hudaybiyah, when the Prophet ﷺ is in a quandary, he doesn't know what to do, the Sahaba are irritated at what's happening with the Quraysh, right? Umm Salama was the one, Ya Rasulullah, don't negotiate with them. Just stand up and do it. Stand up and shave your hair off. Let them see. And they're going to follow you. This is Umm Salama. Right? And this shows us her aql, her wisdom. Shows us her intelligence. Now is not the time to negotiate. They're all irritated. But if you do it, they're going to follow you. Show in your actions that you're the one that's going to be leading. They'll all follow you. So the Prophet ﷺ took Umm Salama's advice. This is Umm Salama here. He took Umm Salama's advice and without saying anything, he just called the barber and he shaved the hair off at Hudaybiyah. And when the Sahaba saw him shaving his hair off, then they began racing one another to see who would shave each other's hair off. So this is uh, Umm Salama. And Umm Salama, she lived a relatively long life. One of the last of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ to die. She died in the year 59 after the Hijrah. This is very late. One of the last. She lived a very old life. She's in her late 80s at this time. And Abu Huraira radiallahu an led her janazah. Abu Huraira led her janazah at this uh, time. And obviously she's one of the last to be buried as well in uh, Baqir. And uh, these are the main uh, wives that we will discuss uh, now. Uh, and so Umm Salama uh, is the sixth wife of the Prophet sallallahu but the fourth one at the time. Because two have passed away. Clear? No, total number six, but then uh, Khadija and Zainab have passed away. And therefore, in reality, she is number four. The fifth wife, which is really a very long story and 
Allahu alam how we will tackle it in too much de- 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 detail, but that is uh, Zainab binti Jahsh that's going to happen soon, another year or so, uh, is going to be Zainab binti uh, Jahsh. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh.